Now we're going to talk about something that no one really agrees about. The concept of mysticism, which is our topic in this lecture, is one of the most ill-defined and confusing concepts in the whole study of religion, which of course is why it's so interesting. Or maybe it's confusing because it's interesting. But at any rate, it's something that every scholar has something different to say about. Everyone has a different way of classifying the various kinds of mysticism, and in some classifications, one person's mysticism doesn't count as mysticism, and so on. So I'd like to lead you into my particular way of dealing with mysticism by um, zeroing in on what mysticism meant in the Western Christian medieval tradition. Because there was a coherent tradition of mystical writing and thinking in that period in the Middle Ages. And I'd like to start by classifying the various strands of mysticism in that period, and then by tracing the original meaning of the word mystical, which got into the Western Christian tradition and makes its way through the medieval uh, tradition. And then finally, I'd like to look at the end of the Middle Ages, in the 14th century, when the whole mystical tradition reached a certain crisis point because of the great figure of Meister Eckhart, who is in many ways the greatest mystic of them all. So let's start with classifications, or strands, or types of mysticism. Uh, I'll call them strands because they can interweave with one another. Uh, one thinker could have various strands of mystical experience. Let me label these four strands the visionary strand, the intellectual strand, the unitive strand, and the affective strand, the strand of, of uh, emotional mysticism. Start with the visionary strand. By that I refer to people who have visions. For instance, Julian of Norwich, a uh, 14th century woman who had a vision of Christ on the cross. It seemed like she saw him right in front of her. And she describes in her book the, the nuances of color on his face as he slowly dried up through thirst. She describes the changing of color. Uh, it's very vivid, very visual. Right? This is not the, the vision of the mind's eye. This is a bodily vision. That's what I mean by visionary uh, mysticism. Many people wouldn't call this mysticism at all. They just call it visionary experience. The second strand, intellectual mysticism. Uh, this would be the sort of thing that you see in Augustine uh, when he talks about uh, glimpsing the, 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 the eternal light shining above the eye of his mind. All that stuff about intellectual vision we've been talking about. Again, this need not be classified as mysticism at all, but some people classify it as such. And then there's unitive mysticism. For many people, including me, uh, this is really the heart of mysticism. What we mainly want to talk about when we talk about mysticism is the unitive experience, the experience of union between the soul and God, or at least the description of union between the soul and God. Uh, you don't have to actually believe that the mystics did unify their souls with God, but you have to deal with the fact that they wrote about it. Um, one way or another, there's a tradition of writing about this experience, however you think about the experience itself. So there's this tradition of writing about union between self and God or soul and God, which has its greatest theorist, in my view, uh, in Plotinus. But it becomes a, a key theme in Christian mysticism in the Middle Ages. And then finally, there's affective mysticism, the mysticism of love, as it's often called. The great representative here is Bernard of Clairvaux, or Saint Bernard, who is a 12th century monk who speaks of the word of God entering the soul the way a bridegroom enters the bedchamber of his bride. And there's a spiritual marriage, and they become one spirit. One spirit comes from uh, Paul. But spiritual marriage is, is a, a key notion here in this uh, affective mysticism. And as I say, these can be combined, and that's what we'll see in the medieval tradition. When we look at the classic medieval mystic tradition, I'll, I'll call it a classical tradition because there's a, a whole bunch of different thinkers who, who fit in a, a broad classification here. The classic mysticism of the Middle Ages is not a visionary mysticism. Uh, visionaries don't need an intellectual tradition, by and large. Um, they don't need um, a high education. The people who are part of the classic mystical tradition tend to be educated men. The visionaries might be uneducated, and they might be women, unlettered women like Julian of Norwich. Um, they don't need to be priests or, or, or uh, educated people in order to have visions of Christ. But the more educated and more intellectual sorts, all male in the Middle Ages, 
will will tend to shy away from the visionary experience because, after all, it is seeing with the eye of the body, and and they're interested in something more quote spiritual, more seeing with the eye of the mind, an experience that goes beyond anything that you could touch with your senses. So in this classical medieval tradition of mysticism, classical mysticism, I'll call it for short, you have a, a series of representative figures. One that I'd like to mention first is Richard of St. Victor in the 12th century. Uh, St. Victor is an abbey in Paris. And then in the 13th century, there's St. Bonaventure. Bonaventure lives at the same time as Aquinas. He's more of an Augustinian, whereas Aquinas is more of an Aristotelian. Both of them combine strands of affective, intellectual, and unitive mysticism. But they, they don't approve of visionary stuff. They, they, they want... To, to ascend beyond the vision of the mind's eye, or the vision of the body's eye, and toward something more like intellectual vision, but then beyond that. For what, what they want to do is, first of all, combine the affective and the intellectual strands the way Augustine did. Right? Augustine already combined these two because, remember, he wanted to, to, to get to this beatific vision of God, and it was love that, that drove him in that direction. So the love is the affective sort of mysticism. The vision is the intellectual mysticism. That was already combined by Augustine. It was already part of the medieval heritage in the 12th century, which is the, which, when, when the great medieval classic mystics um, began their work. In Bonaventure and Richard of St. Victor, the third strand comes in. In addition to the affective and intellectual strands, there's the unitive strand. They're interested in a union with God, union between, the God, between God and the soul, which goes beyond intellectual vision. Now, that's going to be tricky, because they don't want to do this Plotinian thing of, of the soul being really, at its deepest point, identical with God, because that would make the soul divine. So they have to have language for a union with God that goes beyond intellectual vision, but in which the soul in some way goes beyond itself. Right? The soul is not just coming home to its own true being. It's going beyond its natural borders. Uh, one piece of language for that is that the soul passes over. There's a transitus, a passing over into God. This is language that comes from the, the um, story of the Passover in Exodus. Uh, the soul passes over into God, but this passing over is ecstatic. This becomes a technical terminology, uh, a, a piece of technical terminology in medieval mysticism. Uh, ecstasy in the Greek means to stand outside oneself. Right? So the soul goes outside of itself. Right? It, it, it stands outside of itself to pass over into God, who is other than the self. Right? That's the crucial notion. So ecstasy means a passing over into God where, where the soul goes beyond its own borders, as it were. Uh, it doesn't mean trance experience the way we might say it now. It, 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 this is a technical terminology for a, a stage of consciousness which is beyond just um, a trance experience or something. It, it's, it has to be defined in terms of this contrast between intellectual vision and a, a union with God that goes beyond intellectual vision. Another piece of language they'll use, which becomes increasingly important in the mystical tradition, is they'll talk about going into the darkness that is above the light. Right? A super luminous, that is above the light, sort of darkness. This is language that they get from a very important early Christian writer that scholars call Pseudo-Dionysus. Writing in the 6th century, uh, he writes a text called The Mystical Theology, which has this language about ecstasy and about the, 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 um, the darkness above the light, the super luminous darkness. So we need to turn now to this Pseudo-Dionysus, uh, a peculiar figure. Uh, he's called Pseudo-Dionysus because he wrote under the pseudonym of Dionysus. He identified himself with a New Testament character named Dionysus the Areopagite, who was one of St. Paul's first converts in Athens when Paul preached in, in that city. Um, but in fact, he wasn't a first century convert of Paul. He was a sixth century Eastern Orthodox writer, probably in Syria, writing in Greek from the Eastern Christian perspective. But um, his pseudonym was taken seriously by most medieval writers. Most medieval writers um, thought of him as Paul's convert, which gave him a lot of authority. Some medieval writers were suspicious about the, the pseudonym. But for all medieval writers in the West, he was an authoritative teacher of the Christian faith. Not as authoritative as Augustine, but someone who, who you wanted to agree with, because he was, he was telling you about the structure 
of, of the relationship of God and the soul. So he's um, one of the influences of the Eastern Christian tradition on the Western Christian tradition. In the, in the 12th century, there weren't a lot of Eastern Christian writings that the Western writers knew about. They mostly read Augustine, but they also read this one unique Christian writer from the East named um, Dionysus. And thus, an Eastern form of Christian Neoplatonism got into the Western tradition. Because Dionysus is a Neoplatonist, a Christian Neoplatonist, just like Augustine, but a very different kind of Neoplatonist from Augustine. And um, the attempt of medieval writers to combine Pseudo-Dionysus and Augustine lead to some of the most creative developments in medieval thought. Last thing about his name. The West called him Dennis. D-E-N-Y-S usually, but from it we get our name, Dennis. Right? So shortened for Dionysus. And I'll call him Dennis, because the, the writers that I like to read will call him Dennis. Um, none of the medievals called him Pseudo-Dionysus. That's a, a modern description. Okay, so Dennis is the guy who gives us uh, the notion of the mystical. Uh, and so we need to talk about that term. The term mystic comes from a Greek term mysterion, or mystery, right? The original meaning is just a secret. But it became attached to certain special religious practices, especially the religious practices of mystery cults. Um, an example of a mystery cult would be the, the Masons, right? You get initiated into this secret fraternity, and there's all sorts of secret knowledge that you're not given until you're initiated. Right? That's precisely what a mysterion originally meant in Greek, is a secret that you're told when you join the, the group. Right? As a result, baptism came to be called a mystery in the early Christian tradition because there were certain things that converts to Christianity were not told until they were ready to be baptized. For instance, they were not taught the creed in, in the first centuries of Christian history. They weren't taught the creed until they were ready to be baptized. So, the, so baptism became a mystery in precisely that ancient Greek sense. Right? It's an initiation rite and a secret knowledge that you don't get until you're baptized. Um, in the New Testament, originally the term mystery does appear in several places, and it means just the, the, um, the plan of God to save the world uh, through Christ, which is hidden until Christ comes. Right? So the, the word mystery means... Uh, um, not so, not, it's not very specific in the New Testament. But in the early Christian tradition, it gets, on, it gets this very technical, specific meaning of, of baptism and therefore of sacrament. The word sacrament is actually a Latin term, sacramentum, which translates this word mystery. And to this day, the, the Eastern Orthodox call the sacraments mysteries. Right? In other words, the, the Latin term for the sacraments is sacramentum. The Greek Orthodox term for them is, is mysterion or mysteria. Right. So this mis word mystery has a rich, rich history, and then it gets into the title of Dennis's most important writing called Mystical Theology. It probably means something not much more than discourse about the secrets of God. Right. It's a theology about the most secret things of God. And when the term mystic or mystical appears in later writings in the Middle Ages, it's almost always a reference to Dennis. Right. Very often it it's, appears in the phrase mystical theology, and it's clearly meant as a reference to that text. So we need to say a little bit about that text. The text, the mystical theology by Dennis, is about the secrets of God, and therefore one of its key concepts is the incomprehensibility of God, which, remember, was a key concept in Plotinus. Remember, for Plotinus, God is incomprehensible, or the one, which is Plotinus's version of God, is an incomprehensible one above all understanding, above all intellectual light, right, and therefore incomprehensible. And so for Plotinus, you could say that God is, or, yeah, God, if you wanted to, if, if you could get Plotinus to use that word, God is dwelling in a super luminous darkness, a darkness above the light, right? Um, Dennis will pick up that language, as well as the language of God being super essential, above being, above essence. He loves this word super essential, Dennis does. Uh, however, unlike Plotinus, Dennis does not have this project of uniting oneself with the one. His, quest his question in the mystical theology is, how do you talk about an incomprehensible God? Right. So instead of a, a mystical project of mystical union, as in Plotinus, 
for Dennis, the question is, how do you describe an, an incomprehensible God? How do you find language for it? And he proposed what, what's been called the via negativa, the negative way of describing God, by saying what God is not. God is not being, because God is above being. God is not light, because he, he's in the darkness above light. Um, God is not all sorts of things. Um, that's the via negativa. That became very important in uh, classical medieval thought. But in the classic mystical tradition, which I'm trying to describe here, what ended up happening is that this strand of, of um, mystical theology in Dennis is combined with the intellectual mysticism and affective mysticism of Augustine. So there's this project in the classical mystical tradition in the Middle Ages of combining talk about the incomprehensible one with a project of ascending. Right? The, the concern with talking about the incomprehensible one is Dennis's concern. The concern with ascending is Augustinian. Remember, Augustine turned inward and looked upward. Right? So there's an ascent of the soul to the one, who, who, but the one nonetheless remains above all comprehension and understanding. So here we've got two strands of Christian Neoplatonism, Western Christian Neoplatonism with Augustine, Eastern Christian Neoplatonism with Dennis, combining to be the, the, um, the nerve, the heart, the spine of classical mystical thought in the Middle Ages. What happens, though, is that these classic mystics, like Richard of St. Victor and, and Bonaventure, are not happy stopping where Augustine wants to stop. Right? For Augustine, beatific vision, intellectual vision, that's, that's what it's all about. There's no higher level. Whereas for Richard of St. Victor and Bonaventure, there is a higher level. And they want to describe it as something like a union. Now, one thing that goes on in the Middle Ages is this interesting adjustment between Augustine and Dennis about uh, what it means to see God. For Augustine, our soul is like an eye that sees that sun, that platonic sun, and once it's strengthened, once it, it, it overcomes its own sin and is purified, it's, it's ready to just gaze at that sun forever. Right? Um, strange thought. For Dennis, again, God is like a sun, but we never can get used to it. We can never strengthen our, the eyes of our minds so much as to actually gaze at that sun. It's too bright. And we try to gaze at it, and there's this superabundance of light, and that's the darkness above the light. Right? Um, think of how your eyes will be darkened by gazing at the sun. Not because you're gazing into the darkness and the shadow, but because you're gazing into too much light, superabundant light. So for, for Dennis, we can't gaze at the sun and see it. We'll gaze at it, but we'll gaze into a darkness, right? And a darkness above the light, a darkness of too much light for us. So for these 12th century mystics, the last step of mystical ascent is not vision. It's not the soul looking above itself at the source of divine light, but rather this Dionysian, or, um, yeah, this Dionysian ecstasy, right? the soul going beyond itself, outside itself, passing into a darkness that is above the light. Now that's the, um, the classic mystical tradition in the 12th and 13th centuries. That goes into the 14th century, and then there's a new development because of a great genius in mystical thought, Meister Eckhart. Meister Eckhart is a Dominican priest. That is, he's from the same order of preachers as Thomas Aquinas, but a century later. Like Thomas Aquinas, he is a scholastic theologian. That is, he writes, uh, say, biblical commentaries in Latin. He knows all about the, the sort of scholastic theology of the previous century. And by the way, he's called Meister because that's Old High German for master. Master means teacher. Right? The original meaning of master is teacher. So Meister Eckhart means the teacher Eckhart. He gets that name probably because he was a popular preacher in addition to us being a scholastic theologian. He would preach in German. Well, he also preached in Latin, but the memorable sermons are mainly in German. His uh, sermons in Old High German are actually one of the great landmarks of early German literature. And he would speak in a new way, in a way that broke with or broke new paths for medieval mysticism. He starts with, well, he starts in many places, but, but here's one way to start with Meister Eckhart. He starts with the notion of 
the birth of the Son of God in the soul. Now, the birth of the Son of God goes back to Orthodox Christian Trinitarian theology. The idea is, long before Christ was incarnate, he was the eternal Word of God, right? the second person of the Trinity. So from all eternity there is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Son is begotten by the Father before any created thing. Right? So before there was Jesus the man, before there was any, uh, any, any creation, heaven or earth, the Son of God was eternally begotten of the Father. And, and those of you who say the creed in church will recognize that phrase. One way of describing this, one way, of, in fact, of translating is to say that the Father gives birth to the Son. So that would all be standard Orthodox Christian language ever since the Nicene Creed in the 4th century. And there's been a tradition in Christian thought of the birth of the Son of God in the soul. And, and Eckhart got very interested in that notion, and he used it a great deal. He suggests that the eternal begetting of the Son happens at all times and all places, and above all, in the soul. Right? We can, in some way, experience or be one with this eternal begetting of the Son of God in our own soul. How is that possible? Here's the, I guess, the key suggestion, really, for Eckhart. It's possible for us to experience the birth of the Son of God in the soul because in its ultimate depths, the soul is no different from the ultimate depths of God. He's got a language for this. He talks about the ground of the soul, the Grund in German, der Seele, the ground or bottom or deepest side of the soul, which he says is identical with the Grund, the ground, the deepest side of God. So in our, at our bottom level, at the bottom line, we are in some way uh, coinciding with God. And therefore what happens in the Trinity, in all eternity, happens in us, in our souls. I'll suggest that what's going on in Eckhart can be interpreted as a new form of Christian Neoplatonism. Not Augustinian, not Dionysian, and not a combination of the two either. My guess is that Eckhart had read some Plotinus. Uh, some of Plotinus's writings had actually gotten into circulation in the Middle Ages under the title The Theology of Aristotle. It would have been perfectly you know, respectable to read The Theology of Aristotle. And I expected that Eckhart was very intrigued by the Plotinian notion of the deep inner unity of the soul and, and God, or the, the soul and the one. The notion that, that at our highest part we are always identical with the one. So likewise, Eckhart takes this metaphor of height, and he prefers the metaphor of depth. At our deepest part, we are always, in some sense, one with the deepest part of God. Uh, in our depths, the depths of the soul, we are one with the depth of God. The grunt, ground of the soul, is one with the ground of God. So my guess is that Eckhart is introducing into the late medieval tradition of mysticism a rediscovered version of Platinian mysticism. Another way of um, identifying what, what's new about uh, Eckhart is this key concept he has of the uncreated spark. Right? If the, if the ground of our soul is somehow identical with the ground of God, then there's a part of us which was never created. Or there's some aspect of our being which was never created. And that's, that's a really bold notion for a Christian thinker to suggest. Because in classic uh, Christian orthodoxy, there's this fundamental distinction between God the Creator and everything that God created, right? the creature-creator distinction. Everything that exists for classic Christian orthodoxy, like, like Augustine or Dennis, everything that exists is either God the Creator or the things that God created. There's nothing else but those two sorts of things. And God can be called uncreated in the sense that nothing ever created God. Right? Um, there's the old child's question, if God created everything, what created God? Well, the, the traditional Christian answer is simply, nothing created God. God is uncreated. God has always been. Nothing created God, not even God created God, right? because God is eternal. And no, notice now what, what Eckhart is saying. He's saying there's an aspect of ourselves which is uncreated, just like God. Right? There's an aspect of ourselves which is not a created thing. Right? There's an aspect of our souls which is, in the deepest sense, divine. That's the sort of thing that Augustine had avoided saying. 
uh, despite his enthusiasm for, for Plotinus. Whereas Eckhart is willing to, to go further with Plotinus than Augustine is. And thus, for instance, unlike the classic mystics that we've been talking about in the 12th and 13th centuries, Eckhart isn't just talking about a kind of union between God and the soul. He's not just talking about a spiritual marriage where there's the bride and the bridegroom and they get together, but they still remain, you know, sort of two separate persons or two different persons. Not separate, but, you know, a union of two distinct things. For, for Eckhart, there's a kind of identity between the deepest part of the soul and the deepest part of God. They're not, they don't come to one another as other, right, as, as bridegroom and bride do. It's the soul coming home to its deepest self, the soul in a kind of homecoming, finding, ah, this is where I really am, in God. As a result, Eckhart was tried for heresy, because he was, at least in his language, he was violating that crucial distinction between creature and creator. And there's a big controversy to this day about whether Eckhart was really a heretic. Uh, my own view is that um, you can defend Eckhart from the tr charges of, of heresy and say, oh yeah, he really meant the same thing that Orthodox Christians meant. But that takes all the interest out of Eckhart. Right? The interesting Eckhart, the bold and dangerous Eckhart, is precisely the one who risked heresy. Uh, and he probably was a heretic in, as defined by the Orthodox. Um, but that's very controversial. And um, on the other hand, nowadays people aren't upset uh, uh, to be heretics. Um, I think one way of putting this is, if your main interest in life is fidelity to Christian orthodoxy, then Eckhart is not going to be your favorite thinker. But if one of your main interests in life is what might tie the deepest aspects of Christianity to other religions, right, then Eckhart might be just the Christian you want, you want to study because of that similarity between Eckhart's thought and Plotinus' thought, and as, as I suggested when I lectured about Plotinus, between uh, Plotinus and Hinduism. Right? That notion that some, at some deep level, at a deep level of inner unity, if we find that level, what we found is God. Right? Um, Augustine can't go that far. Right? When he gets to the deepest level of the soul, he's still just himself, and God is above him. Whereas for Eckhart, it seems when you get to that deep level, you found God. And that seems to be true for, for Hinduism. It's certainly true for Plotinus. Well, that ended up becoming a road that medieval mysticism did not take because it was leading into heresy. And so Eckhart remains the great representative of that daring, bold sort of attempt to push the envelope. Maybe he broke the envelope. So after the 14th century, mystical movements take a different direction. Uh, some of them end up in the direction of, of visionary mysticism, like with Julian of Norwich. Others end up emphasizing affective mysticism, emphasizing a love that goes beyond understanding, which is very modern, right? Most of us will think that love can take us further than, than intellect can, right? Ask any modern person, which, which understands things more deeply, love or intellect? And almost any modern will pick love. Well, that became a very popular choice also in the 14th century in medieval mysticism. Love gets us closer to God than mere intellect. Another theme of 14th century mysticism, which was very prominent in Eckhart, but also in others, is the notion of simplifying the soul, of purifying, up, purifying it of its involvement, not just with the physical world, which is, of course, a standard theme of Christian thinking since Augustine, but also purifying it of intellectual ideas, including even Platonic forms, right? We, because we're, Eckhart wants to get beyond that point. Uh, so there's this notion of simplifying the soul, purging it, making it, in Eckhart's terms, bare and empty. But again, that's a direction that not everyone wanted to follow him in. So the more standard Christian mysticism of the 14th century ended up focusing on the image of darkness. Right? Um, if your vision is full of a multitude of different things, then you're distracted by all this multiplicity. And you want something simpler and truer than all that multiplicity. So you want a darkness, not a light. But of course, that keys in with the language from Dennis of the darkness above the light. And so a lot of these 14th century writers love that, that image from Dennis uh, of the darkness above the light, a dark night of the soul, they'll call it. That kind of language is already present in a 14th century guide to spiritual direction called the cloud of unknowing. 
Uh, it talks about this entering the dark night above the light. And then it becomes um, the center of a deep mystical theology in the 16th century in Spain with St. John of the Cross, who writes a whole book on the dark night of the soul. It's this purification and simplification of the soul that happens when you lose everything. Um, St. John of the Cross was also a spiritual director. He was spiritual director for St. Teresa of Avila. He was probably thinking of that time in the life of a, of a monk or a meditative Christian when your whole life is devoted to prayer and all of a sudden you have a dry spell. All of a sudden your prayers are cold and dead and you have no emotion at all. And, and your, your whole life is devoted to prayer and your prayers are empty, cold, you're in the dark night of the soul when nothing seems to matter. And that's when your soul is really formed in the love of God. When you seem farthest from God, far away from any sort of consolation and love, but you keep praying in this dark night. And your soul is shaped and deepened in the love of God. So you can see how, how this, uh, this imagery of the darkness above the light is very useful for Christian thinkers uh, in a whole different bunch of ways. A, a, a key image like the darkness above the light can mean several different things depending on who you ask and when. Which is one of the reasons why, as I said at the beginning, mysticism can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people.